All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Angela Peacock and I'm a subject to the film Medicating Normal. I also volunteer doing outreach for the film and I host conversations like this one today. This is our 20th interview and today our guest is Kim Witzak. We know Kim because she actually met one of the filmmakers in the Minneapolis airport um, while they were doing research from the film and Kim shared her story and kind of, it's just heart-wrenching story what happened to her family. And um, she just was supportive from the beginning. So that's how we met her. Me and her were actually supposed to sit on a panel together at UCLA right when the pandemic happened. We had to cancel it, but we still, we kept in touch all this, all this time. So I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. So I'm gonna read Kim's bio. It's really impressive. Um, it's kind of long, so hang in there with me. All right, Kim is an international drug safety advocate and speaker with over 25 years of professional experience in advertising and marketing communications. She became involved in pharmaceutical drug safety issues after the sudden death of her husband in 2003 due to an unsolicited, I'm sorry, undisclosed drug side effect of antidepressants. She was instrumental in helping to get the FDA black box drug, black box suicide warnings and added to antidepressants in 2004 and 2006. Kim has taken her personal experience and launched a national public awareness campaign through woodymatters.com, a grassroots organization dedicated to make sure that everyday perspective represented, represented in health care conversations. Woody Matters puts a human face on the real life, sometimes tragic consequences of our current flawed drug safety system. Kim has been featured in major news media such as Fortune, Reader's Digest, Consumer Reports, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Star Tribune, as well as a subject of numerous local and national television news stories and documentaries. She has testified before the U.S. Senate on FDA-related issues, as well as numerous FDA advisory committees. In 2013, Kim organized the Selling Sickness, People Before Profits International Conference held in Washington, D.C. that brought academic scholars, healthcare reformers, consumer organizations and advocates, and progressive health journalists to develop strategies and solutions challenging the selling of sickness. She was appointed consumer representative on the FDA Pharmacologic Drug Advisory Committee in 2016 and as a board member with several nonprofit agencies in the field of drug and patient safety, such as MIST.co, U.S. Patient Safety Network, Recheck Investigative Health Journalism, and Institute for Scientific Freedom. Thank you for joining us, Kim. What do you Hi. think when I read all of that, all that you've done? Well, first of all, I'm going to say thank you for having me. Uh, you know, when I first met you, at the film up when it was in Minneapolis, I was just blown away by your story. And when I see films like this and I see other stories, but that it just makes me so mad. And, and it's also the inspiration of why I keep going. So I'm super honored that I'm on your, on your show today. And I'm super proud of what you've, uh, what you and this film have accomplished. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So is there anything you think you wanna add before we jump into the questions? Uh, no, we, I think that's good. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot, right? So uh, yeah. my first question is, you know, I last night, just to be transparent, I watched as many videos as I could on you just to like hear from your story. And oh, it was so emotional for me just to hear it. And um, I kind of cried along with you uh, reading when you would, you know, talk about your story. So in, in one of the videos, you said that you're an accidental advocate. And I personally can completely relate to that. Like, I never wanted this to happen to me, you know, and it, it just did, it just kind of happened. So can you, um, you, you also said sometimes the work chooses you, you don't choose the work. So can you tell us like, what were you doing before your advocacy? Like, what was your life like before Woody's death? Well, well, first of all, I do call myself the accidental advocate. It's kind of how I define my life today. I do a lot of different things. I have a portfolio career. And before I got into this advocacy work of drug safety, I was already doing work around working with kids that have been abused, neglected, at risk with the power of arts in healing. And that was my passion. And that was my passion then. And I you know, spent my entire career in advertising. I still am in advertising. And you know, that's what I was doing before. I loved it. I, it was also an insight. And I start looking at my life and I think all of our lives in, 
we all are like tapestries and these are all like they, uh, you know, things that we did when we were kids kind of informs the next thing and then the next thing. And then you start seeing how all of the pieces start to come together and how you sometimes, you know, ultimately I became, I like to call, you know, the accidental advocate because I didn't choose this work of drug safety. I never would have chose this work. I had other things that were my passion, but it now all makes sense. Yeah. I can, I can relate to that too, because I had taken like media training and uh, some public speaking training and you do, you do a couple newspaper articles and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, you have a platform and like, you have this thing that you need to talk about and you had all the training leading up to now. Right. You just maybe didn't have the story yet. Right. And didn't realize that you were going to eventually have that story. And, you know, I think a lot of that today, again, I didn't choose this. I would never have chosen this, but, you know, when I look back and, and I'm sure we'll get into um, what became, you know, what is my purpose now, but it all, it does make sense. And it's the lens in which I see things in the work that I still do. And it's been 18 years wow. since um, my husband passed away, which is yeah. crazy that I'm still doing this work. Wow. Well, there's so much to be done. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. So let's move, move into, you know, kind of, can you share with us? It's always touchy for me to talk about this because it's like your personal trauma, you know, and so I'm, I do it in the most respectful manner, but can you tell the audience kind of what happened to Woody, your husband, uh, how it all started, what led him to take Zoloft and just, just share what happened to him? Sure. Uh, it was in 2003. Life was great. We've been married almost 10 years. We're going into, um, into 2003. We're excited. Woody had just started his dream job um, with a startup company within um, lighting. He was a guy who loved to recycle. I mean, he was bringing back recycling before other, you know, from trips. And I'd be like, what are you doing with all this stuff? So he was really excited because this company was like energy efficient lighting, which, you know, I can still hear him in my head. And I, um, so anyways, but with the new job came stress. Um, You know, he's waking up in the middle of the night. He was a guy that always had eight hours of sleep. Um, and he was starting to wake up in the middle of the night, which truthfully looking back is not uncommon for entrepreneurs or any of us really. And it's a different shift in how we think about, you know, when you do wake up in the middle of the night, but, you know, like I said, he was a guy that needed eight hours. And so he went to see his family doctor, his general practitioner that he has seen for years and was sent home with a prescription, not even a prescription, it was a three week sample pack of Zoloft. And, it, and they told him it would help take the edge off and help him sleep. So meanwhile, I had just left to go to New Zealand on uh, one of my three week advertising shoots. So I was out of the country the first three weeks he was on this drug. Wow. And the three week sample pack that he got stepped him up from 25 milligrams to 50 milligrams, which I think is a pretty common, you know, approach and, and with the sample packs. Uh, so meanwhile, I'm having the time of my life and, you know, this other part of the country and Woody started having like all of these, you know, side effects. And he felt like even worse and probably anxiety that he's never had before. And I'll never, you know, I got back and I, I kept checking in with him and my parents had him over for dinner, but literally I've never saw any of this coming. So I come home from New Zealand and I was excited for him to come, you know, make him dinner or whatever. I was waiting for him and he came home from his day on the, um, and he was, had a blue dress shirt on with a white undershirt and he was soaked through it. And he came in the back door went in the fetal position. He's like, Kim, you got to help me. I don't know what's happening to me. Oh my God. And he's like this, it's like my head tight. It's outside my body looking in, help me. And I remember like looking at him, I had no idea what that was. I had no idea, but I helped calm him down. You know, I'm like, let's pray. Let's yoga breathe. Let's, you know, do everything. And so, you know, called the doctor, a doctor and said, you got to give it four to six weeks to kick in. So, you know, the next, that was actually the start of the end. So the next week of Woody's life, every night he would come home from work. And during this time, he's still running. He's still, uh, he was like a big runner, but he couldn't run his normal, like 10 miles. He was running like three miles. He was doing everything. He'd become, what do you think about hypnosis? What do you think about acupuncture? What do you think about all these things to stop this head out his body? 
Wow. So that was every day. And that's kind of who, what he was. He was always like trying to figure out how do I stop? Like, well, how do I fix something? Well, anyways, we had a big uh, engagement party for uh, some friends. We, the next, it was Sunday, cleaning it up. Everything was great. We're talking about like planning our, to have it, to go through um, in vitro to have kids and also our 10 year anniversary trip. And literally um, I left the next day and it was like a normal day leaving. I was out of town for work and I'll never forget. It was Tuesday, August, uh, Wednesday, August 6th. And I hadn't, it was morning. I had not heard from him. I called my dad. You know, he didn't call me in the typical way he always calls me. So I kept calling him during the day, but I was busy at work. So I thought no big deal. But literally by like um, early evening, I had still not heard from Woody, which is unlike us. I mean, we talk all the time. So I call my parents and I go, hey, would you do me a favor? Just run over and check on Woody. You know, he's been um, really tired. So I'm thinking something like that. The next thing within minutes, I get a call. It's bad. It's bad. Um, and I'm literally still on a set working and I'm like, what do you mean it's bad? And like, he's dead and he's dead and they're screaming, he's dead. And I can still hear that in my head. And um, I was out there and I, I, I couldn't even like, fa like fathom, like, what do you mean he's dead? Like thinking he hit his head, he fell. And my dad's like, no, he's hanging, hanging by the rafters in our garage. And literally I, that minute, my life just changed. The coroner called and, or then she, the coroner got on the phone when they called him, um, called her and asked if he was on any medication. Wow. First question she asked, and I, I didn't even know what it was called. I didn't, that's how, I mean, that's how involved I was at that time in 2003. And all of a sudden she said, there's a bottle of Zoloft sitting on the kitchen counter under a light. Cause I thought it was upstairs. And she said, we're going to take it with us. It might have something to do with his death. Wow. Wow. And this is like, I mean, he had no signs of depression, no pre-existing history. Like it, but what, what, what baffles me the most is that you literally called the doctor and said, like, he feels like his head is outside of his body. And they said, give it a few more weeks. Yes. There was no recognition that that could be a side effect. Well, you got to remember this is 2000, you know, I, I say this, you got to remember it's 2003, but I really think there's some of that. It still goes on today, yeah. all yeah. these years, but it was 2003. He um, was given it for like, again, off label. We didn't even know what off label for insomnia. He had never had a history of depression. He didn't, um, he didn't get it for depression or any other mental um, health issues. Right. He right. had it for insomnia and he had like some work anxiety, you know, like work sleeplessness. Yeah. And literally the doctor said four to six weeks, but that was what they were telling that, you know, most of these GPs are educated by our, by the pharmaceutical reps and it's, yeah. you know, and it still goes on, but back then. And at that point, the other thing that was interesting about Woody's story and I think it became, you know, it makes sense now when it tells how we got it. But the front page of our newspaper had an article the day Woody was found that said the UK finds link between antidepressants and suicide in teens. Oh my goodness. So you had that clue and you had the coroner who said, was he on any medications? And I said, Zoloft. And she told my um, family that was at my house, I was still in Detroit trying to figure out how to get home. Yeah. And they said, we're going to take that bottle with us. It might have something to do with it. So at that point, my brother-in-law Googled Zoloft and suicide and all of this stuff came up um, on the, on the Google. Amazing. Who knew? It's crazy. In 1991, the FDA had hearings on Prozac and suicide. Did nothing. It's 2003. So literally within, you know, as my life fell apart, my brother-in-law started Googling and finding articles and ordering books and, and literally stayed up all night long reading and found all these links. Wow. I mean, and you say it's, it was 2003, but like it's 2021 and this is not common knowledge. Am I correct? Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's for somebody who has been involved and tried, you know, instantly that became kind of our passion to go out and get black box warnings, put on these drugs. And 
that was 2004, 2006. And to know that environment that was back then, well, you know, people like us who have been involved in it have, we know what the history is, but the reality is people today don't know, they hear the, all the drug ads, they hear the suicide, they don't even, people just kind of, you know, wipe past that, it doesn't mean anything. And truthfully, the doctors don't necessarily, they'll say, oh, well, that's just an issue with kids, or that's what the lawyers make you put on. But no, it is a real, and yeah. it's real, and it's real that, and it's, it's important, why it's important, like you doing these type of um, interviews is to remind people that there's a whole long history behind this and remind them that there are still dangers that we don't know and that we're not even being told. Yes. Oh my God. You're getting into so much good stuff. Like I'm like, slow down. Cause we have, there's Oh my God. I know. Sorry. So, no, it's okay. You said so much good stuff there. So let's, let's transition to black box warnings. Like take me through that process. What was it like to fight to get a black box warning on there? But also what you just said is why do we not believe that actually happens or why don't doctors take it seriously? Even patients. I, I think I've read it myself and thought, Oh, that won't happen to me. So t take me through the black box warnings. Well, you have to remember in 2000, well, first of all, a black box warning is the most serious of all warnings that the FDA issues. It means that there are serious or even deadly side effects. So it takes a lot to put a black box warning on the drug, especially after it's been on the market. But, you know, it was at that point in 2003, we started going out 2004, we met a lot of families and these hearings it's amazing what the power of people and people like you and I, everyday people who've had experiences when they show up and tell their story. But those, um, we would go meet with Congress. I think members of Congress were the ones that eventually pushed the FDA to have these hearings. Mm. And when you went to these hearings, you started to see um, and meet all these families. And first of all, if I could explain the room, it was packed. And there were news cameras all the way around the room and as well as secured, um, security armed guards. Wow. Because there were families that were up there saying, you killed my kid, you know, because it was all this stuff for families, again, like 13 year olds that were hanging. Uh, you know, you start putting all those stories together and some were angry. And then you of course had people who were there saying, these drugs saved my life. Yeah. And then you would have experts like David Healy, who I know you're going to have on the show in a couple of weeks. Yeah. They, they got, they've been working on this stuff for a long time and they were only given three minutes at these FDA hearings to tell what they knew and what was happening in their country. So yeah. we got a group of people together. We were able to, we had meetings at the FDA. It was fascinating listening to, I will never forget this, David Healy, along with um, internal FDA, uh, it was Bob Temple and Tom Lochran and those two, like them going back and forth and all those families are all like, uh, <laughs> because they know their stuff, right? Uh, so that was pretty fascinating. But eventually the FDA did come out and add the warning for kids. But you know, a lot of the, meanwhile, I had, um, I had a lawsuit and we were able to get some of the documents out from under seal that showed that they knew about the suicide risk and they knew it in adults. Yeah. So the next phase of getting black box warnings was to get it for young, well, for all ages, but of course they stopped at 24 years old. So we knew that we needed to do something um, a little bit different because the families you know, there were quite a few people and I always thought about common sense. Like how does the drug know that you're 23 today? I was just going to ask but that. You're 24 tomorrow. You're gonna ask it. It's so crazy. It, the body, no. you're, it's so, like, it's such an arbitrary age. Like that yeah. whole idea of common sense or like you're getting it for pre, you know, menstrual dysphonic disorder. I'm getting it for anxiety. Somebody's getting it for social anxiety. Somebody's right. getting it for depression. Like how does the body know what it's getting? I mean, the whole thing's insane that you just wouldn't put it on all ages. Yeah. So the next day or the day before we, um, I helped coordinate a press conference where we had all the experts like David Healy, um, uh, Dr. Jen, uh, Glenn Mullen, 
yeah. families, the lawyers that would, and we invited the media to say, this is the story you are not going to hear tomorrow at the FDA hearing. It is all ages. And so it was pretty, uh, I'm so glad that we did it because a lot of media attended. But at the end of the day, they stopped and put it this 24 years old. And, you know, I've heard now, even today, that they're saying that they blame the war, some side blames the warnings for causing more suicides. And the I reality is that. all ages are at risk. You know, I don't understand why we just don't say it. It's, I've said it from day one. It's information. All it is, we're not saying take it off the market. We're saying it's information. And don't you decide what information you think is important to us consumers and patients you let give us the information so we have a fair shot you're you might lose a little bit of sales for people who might but you know we didn't have a chance because no. we didn't know this head outside the body and when we um ended up talking with uh which became my law firm bomb headland they had a document that actually talked about head outside the body and pfizer writing back on 50 milligrams Pfizer wrote back to this, um, this, and it was the uh, South African kind of FDA equivalent agency, you know, the FDA, uh, and said, this happens on all SSRIs. We don't know why. And I'm thinking, why didn't you tell the doctors? We didn't have a chance. We didn't have a chance because you guys got to control what information, because ultimately, who, who are you really working for? The industry or are you working for us? the public, you know, the public. But, but what you said was, well, no, the argument that I've heard was the black box warning is actually dangerous because it causes people that might be suicidal. They're too afraid to take the drug. So like, we need to take that off. Hasn't there been a push for that recently to take the black box warnings off? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's been a push to take it off for a long time. And I think it's usually coming from, you know, the industry kind of funded um, groups, yeah. but think about that. If it made sense, you know, I think when I go back and, and I would encourage people to go and look at 1991 footage that's available out from the hearings on Prozac, literally it's the same stories, just hairstyles are different, wardrobes are different, but it's the same story. I think I've seen that, I, where the women are, they have really big glasses and feathered yeah. hair and they're screaming at the microphone. They're yeah. screaming at the, but that yeah. is the FDA here. And they're like, no, we don't see any link with it. So they knew it from here and they're, you know, sitting here. The reality is when you, that again, defies common sense. If, and they've always blamed the person, right? So the thing and why I think Woody's story was so powerful, he didn't get it for depression. He didn't get it for any mental health stuff. He got it because of starting a new job, like being an entrepreneur. And right. all of a sudden, five weeks later, he hung himself. And like that was the only thing new in his life. So you yeah. think about it and it makes no sense if you're saying, if some, well, let's just even say, if it's, if it makes somebody who's depressed go on to kill themselves, isn't that more of a reason why you have a warning so that if somebody is getting it, they can watch for something and yes. know that it might be, that might be a side effect. Yes. It's crazy. But I will never understand question, that. But that's the question. And I'll bring myself in here. My personal experience was when I became suicidal, the drug was not implicated. The, it was the mental illness. It's your depression right. is worse. You need to go in the hospital. Never was it seen like maybe it's one of the drugs you're on, or maybe it's the combination of drugs and we should take you off of something. It was always add something to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's blame, you know, again, blame the person, the, not the, blame drug. the person, blame the illness. But then you start when I, one of the things, when I go back to, you know, I thought my mission would be just get the black box warnings on and then I'm out. I'm going to go back to my, you know, my other job and my, the things that I love. But I realized it wasn't just a systemic issue with anti, or it wasn't just a isolated issue with antidepressants. It was really how our, it's a systemic problem. Once how drugs get on the market, how, um, you know, even our doctors, I learned things like I just trusted that, you know, and I think Woody did too. We trust our doctors and we, and doctors assume and trust that the FDA has done their job. And so yeah. we all, it's the whole system is built on trust. And when I learned, uh, when I learned that doctors do not learn how the FDA works or how the approval process works in the system, you know, like in med school, how do they ever even know to question? And if you're being educated by 
the pharmaceutical companies, or you start looking at journals that have been written. And so there are all these things that I learned like ghostwriting. I had no idea of ghostwriting. So if our doctors and ghostwriting is basically, you know, somebody else is writing the articles that are appearing in the medical journals that our doctors read. And then you think about, they don't have enough time to understand everything. So of course it's easy to go, well, you know what? Maybe that's not working, Angela. We should probably layer another one on because your depression, you have. And so basically you start planning these things in uh, people's minds. It's like, we have to really do better. Yes. Oh, there's so many issues. You, oh. Oh my god. I know. Sorry. I <laughs> Oh no, I love it. It's like I just I could talk to you for like 5 hours straight because like you just said so many good things. One, I'll just say, you know, I, we like to blame our doctors especially when it's so personal to us. Like why didn't you see my suicide as a side effect? Like you ruined years of my life putting me on more medication. Why didn't you know that? But at the same time, I have to give doctors a little grace because they're a victim of this too. They don't mm -hmm. learn this stuff. And mm -hmm. and the average drug rep is a 25-year-old good-looking chick coming yep. in with a suitcase, I've seen them buying them lunch and, and literally selling them a product. They're not scientists, they are drug reps, they are right. salespeople. And they're right. not gonna tell them this drug might cause suicide in your patients. And if that happens, this is what to look for. No, because they would never sell the drug, you know? Right. Anyway, oh, there's so many good stuff there. Okay. Yeah. So when you look back on all the advocacy that you've done, what are some highlights maybe besides the black box warnings? Well, for sure, I would say black box warning. Uh, another thing would be meeting amazing people and families that we all say we didn't choose this, but we're in a club. And I think that, that there's power in people. Uh, so that was one thing, but also I've had uh, the opera, I was invited to testify at the US Senate in front of Ted Kennedy, Ted Kennedy was the chair, but Obama and Hillary were there. And that's more of a personal thing from, because Woody loved politics, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And that was a really amazing experience to not only share Woody's story, and I think why is the sharing Woody's story, but also having ideas in what could be done. Uh, so that was a highlight without a doubt. And I would say the opportunity to, you know, having a lawsuit, and getting documents out from the lawsuit that we were literally marching binders. I probably had, we would bring like a, a binder to, to every single office of all the documents that were released in my case um, that actually showed the FDA knew, the drug companies know, have known for a long time and marched them out, gave them to media, gave them. And so that was another highlight to see the power of documents when you see in black and white, how can you ignore this? So that was the one. And then I would see the other is I've traveled, got that privilege to travel and meet a lot of international, getting an international perspective. Yeah. And it was at the conference in Amsterdam. Oh, that was the video oh, I watched last night. Yeah. Um, I, called, sell, well, probably another one, Selling Sickness, where it was in 2010. And literally we're there because I like to travel. It was a good excuse to like learn something, but every example they were using came from the U S and yet there were a handful of us from the U S and I'm like, why aren't we talking about it back, you know, in our country. And then eventually I helped to co-organize one here. So that was another huge highlight um, that I, and I love that term selling sickness. And yeah, me too. I like that too. So, but, but I don't know. I just can't, I can't help but be struck by this. Okay, if they've known this since 91, we are in 2021. What is that, 30 years? Why are these Why are these drugs still on the market? Well, it's funny, I think, well, I just look at this last year with the pandemic, right? I mean, people, well, first of all, let's even back up before that. You said when you took the drug, you, you saw the warning, you didn't think anything of it, right? because it's probably the similar thing that most people, it's probably not gonna create that. Or it's, you know, you go, you go skydiving, you're thinking, oh, that'll never happen. They, that risk will never happen. So I think there's part of that, right? Mm -hmm. I think there's the wanting a quick fix. It's too easy to take a pill. And it, so there's that culturally, right? The system is set up where it's really, 
it's, you know, let's give a prescription. It's one of the easy tools. And it's interesting because those drugs are the, they almost feel like they're sold as they're benign. Um, that, that they're being, but it's benign, right? That it is, that they're almost like, you know, easy. It's like the first entree into taking it with the antidepressants. But then also when the antidepressants don't work, it becomes, oh, you have bipolar depression. And then I keep seeing this, what, uh, what's happening is adding more things on to, to your diagnosis. And there you go. And here they well, are. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you're not even, you, you we're talking mostly about suicide, but I mean, I've read the Adderall pamphlet, for instance, because I had a family member come off of it really quick. And then she went into an extreme state and it was very paranoid and, um, you know, a very high anxiety. And so I went in and I read the Adderall pamphlet, by the way, anybody in the audience, all you have to do is put in the drug name, FDA insert or FDA pamphlet. It'll pop right up. It's like 35 pages. Anyway, so I, I pulled it out. I started reading it and I was, I was like shocked at what I was reading. Like at any moment taking a therapeutic dose, people may experience psychotic states. Like it's literally right there. It says withdrawal effects. Like it, it says all these things. But when I talked to Michael Baum, I said, you know, when you add a black box warning to benzos, which the FDA just did, you know, last mm -hmm. fall, I guess, uh, does that change clinical practice? And he was like, no, nobody reads it. It can be there. And it's like, nobody, it's, you know, it just, I don't know. Well, so, you look at some of those, like, so you're right. We're only talking about the suicide, but it's the withdrawal, the sexual side effects, the, uh, you know, even looking at the benzos they're, I mean, they're scheduled two drugs, you know, it's not yeah. even FDA. Like those are some pretty highly addictive drugs that we don't even, parents don't even know. Like, so they're med, there's, um, it's something called um, it's a med guide that comes out that our doctors should be giving it to everybody because these are available for parents, especially when you look at the kids um, to 18, they should be getting one for all of these drugs because it kind of talks about each of the things that yeah. could go wrong issues. And, but that's not being done. And I think it's just like standard of care, yeah. you know, kind of left on us. Yeah. Well, so that brings us to the pandemic. Like one of the most horrifying things, the statistics that I saw during the pandemic was that prescribing rates for antidepressants and benzodiazepines are, have gone up 30 to 40% during the pandemic. And that brings us back to the title of the film, Medicating Normal. Like even me, I am anxious. Like I'm scared to go in the store. People are taking their masks off. They're getting close to me. I'm like, oh my God, what do you have? Like it's, it's a collective trauma that we're all going through. But the anxiety and depression that I feel, I recognize that this is normal. Yeah, it doesn't feel good. When I say this is normal, it doesn't mean that like your suffering isn't real. It mm -hmm. sucks. I don't want to feel depressed. I don't want to feel afraid to go in the grocery store, but like it's happening. So what, what, what do you think about all this rise in prescriptions and people not even knowing about what's on the pamphlet? Well, first of all, you're right. Uh, the pandemic last year was a ripe, ripe opportunity to, and I could, I mean, I predicted it right when it happened that sales are going to go up. And I just saw a statistic last week and it was the global antidepressant market went from 14.3 billion in 2019 to 28.6 billion in 2020. Double. And so it doubled. Yeah, that was sales. And, it, you know, and, and I saw it with new prescriptions of anxiety meds, sleep meds, and antidepressants. And put that in addition to most of the prescribing became telemedicine, right? So doing what you and I are doing with our doctor there, it's, we are not having a deep conversation. It's like, I will give you a script and here you go. And so there, I guarantee you a lot of things were missed in, and in this um, being a discussion about potential adverse harms. Um, is this really the first thing we should be doing? And should we have an exit strategy? Like, or even maybe starting at the question, I understand it's completely like, it is normal that people are feeling like people have lost their livelihoods. Some people have lost loved ones in this time and it is normal. And so why isn't there a discussion about 
maybe it's, you know, can we come with other, like, are there other behavioral things? Are there things like getting out, exercise, you know, is there meditating, like things that we can, tools that yeah. we can give people, but it's, and I, what the sad part for me is I keep thinking about the missed information that doesn't, isn't given or passed along to the person on the other side of the telemedicine, you know, the patient. Well, even when you say that, I think of like, maybe people need validation and, you know, to be seen, like, I see you're suffering. I know you're struggling, like mm -hmm. I'm struggling too, you know, but how can you do that on zoom? Like it's, right. it's hard. Like even me trying to have a connection with you is hard. Like I'm looking at the camera, but you're down here, you know what I mean? So it's like, how do you connect with someone to validate that? Do they even have time? Like the average GP sitting in, you know, a small practice with, attached to a hospital, they don't have time or even the energy to give empathy to 18 patients a day or whatever, however many they see. So it's easier to give a pill and then they don't get the informed consent. And then, you know, when this pandemic starts winding down and people start getting back to normal life, if that even happens, I don't know. But then are they going to say, oh shit, like, how do I get off of this? Right. Or are they just going to continue it and not know? Or if they seek out a doctor and say, hey, can you help me off of this? Then what's going to happen? Are they going to come off too quickly? Because we all know the withdrawal experiences. I mean, ugh, there's just so many yeah, problems. It's there's so many problems when you look at it, but it's, I think you're right. It starts with connecting, right. And connecting like, and feeling, and I think that's what, you know, this pandemic did. We had isolation and you realize the importance of human connection and saying, I'm, you're not alone. Like this is normal that you are feeling this way. You know, I, I go back to this idea that we, as a society, want to, and I loved the name medicating normal for this. Um, it was after Woody died and I was at the doctor and she asked if I wanted something. And I looked at her and I said, I think this is what killed my husband. But I said, aren't I supposed to hurt? Like my husband died. She, and then she said, but you don't need to. What? You don't need to. And I'm like, I think I do. I think I have to hurt because I hurt because I loved. And I think that is just something that, you know, if we would put some of that in there, like it's normal to hurt. It's normal that we're scared. It's normal. We're humans. You just made have to, yeah. Oh, you just made no, you made me tear up because uh, my, obviously my husband didn't die, but my dog died, my service dog. And you know, me, me and you were texting about it. But um, what you just said really struck me because would I take a pill to not have to feel what I just felt? No. That would be robbing my humanity for me. You know what I'm saying? So like, I just find it so insensitive that you have a choice. You can either feel this or don't feel it. But like, is that, do we not want to feel anything? I mean, then what is, what's the point of being a human being? Right. Oh, oh my God. That is just, wow. Sorry. I literally, well, first of all, um, yeah. Cry, yeah. Please. You know, some, you could cry and you know what? Crying is okay. Like where we've also learned, like, we're not supposed to feel where, where like who made, when did this become normal? You know, it's funny yesterday and it's a side story that, uh, you know, I like please, side please, stories please. because I'll go somewhere, <laughs> but um, I live in Minneapolis where it is the George Floyd. And so I took my niece down to the George, the anniversary of George Floyd. And I started talking to this um, woman. Uh, she was doing a whole thing, a quilt um, for gun violence. Uh, they were doing it and started and, you know, and then of course I had to bring up some of my passion of like the link between, you know, medicines and, yeah. and psych and, and drugs and shootings. But this other guy was sitting there and he heard, and he had been in and out of mental health and he overheard our conversation. He was just sitting on the ground and he came over, he asked me to come over and he said, they told me 15 years ago, I was a performance artist. I was creative and they told me I was crazy and they tried to kept telling me that I needed to go in and they stepped, he said, I had to for, they were trying to like kept forcing me telling other people telling me I'm crazy. And then this guy went off, he said, and I looked at him, he goes, 
I realize that there are people that say that they're out fighting for the mentally ill. Some of our, what I learned, and this is one of the other like patient advocacy groups that yeah. are heavily funded by industry. And he kept saying, I thought they were fighting for, for me. And I realized how much money they were getting from industry. And it's more, they were fighting for more drugs, right? And he said, what if it's okay? And he asked me this question, what if it's okay that I'm like, I'm a free spirit. I like to like dance. I like to do, and he was a performance artist and he yeah. was happy. Like, is that bad? Like, so we, st you know, you start looking at the whole philosophy and yeah. it's a bigger question and not just like, was there a clinical study of, you know, a hundred people or a thousand people and, you know, all of this and start going back to something that I always learned a long time ago, you know, it's an analogy where people are out, there's a bunch of babies floating down a river and, you, you know, people are pulling the babies out, trying to save them. And then somebody said, who's throwing them in the, in the water? Let's go up there. Let's go up there. And the, who's throwing them in the river? And so I think we have to like almost take a step back yes. to how did we get here and start looking at instead of a sickness model, um, let's start looking at a well, you know, even I don't even like the word mental health for me know, because mental health says it's your, it's like a sickness right. model. But what if we take a step back and say mental well-being and what are the elements of mental well-being from physical, spiritual, and, and, and also realizing that people have had paths that got them to the place. Does it necessarily, and mean they're that you're broken I go look at my kids and this is you know how I got even this before Woody died I was volunteering um, I helped, helped start Free Arts Minnesota I was working with these kids that were in a foster group it was we just had a great session with the kids this was like 1997 before Woody died and there, um, it was seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night, the volunteers, you know, we were working with them and their staff said, hey, let's go up to the, where the kids live. You can show them where you live. And the kids are like, woo. And every one of the kids stopped by a, um, the window and picked up a cup of meds. And I was like, oh my God, are they all sick thinking they have like strep throat? And she's like, oh no. And the, the counselor was just like, oh no, that's just their behavior medicine. And I was like, behavior medicine? Like, are they broken? Wow. Like, I was thinking about that going, that was well before even Woody died. And that idea of we like looking at kids who have maybe had horrible stuff, like, is there a different way than just medicating it for it to go away? It doesn't go away. And so I think it, I don't know. I think that we're in an opportunity and, and I think films like medicating normal. Um, and there's a lot of people out there in this community that are thinking about it in a different way. Are there other ways that we can really be talking about this and not from here's a quick pill. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like that. I've said that in, in a panel a few times, but you're even making me think of something that happened last night on a panel, a psychiatrist spoke up and, you know, said, you know, some, yes, we don't medicate normal people, but some people really need the meds and are really mentally ill. And I just thought it, it brushed me so wrong because I thought like, who gets to decide that? And before you even get there, why didn't you ask the question? How did the person get to where they are? Maybe you drove them crazy. Yeah. And, and when I, and I, I was so triggered, I couldn't even talk because I was just like, <laughs> this is what is wrong with everything. Because I know for a fact, like I was made mentally ill mm -hmm. by all the drugs and the cascade right. of prescriptions and the snowballing and blah, 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 blah. But so it's easy. It's an easy cognitive dissonance defense to say, well, you might be normal, but like some people really aren't you know right. they really need it and that's a deflection technique like I don't want to hear your message I'm gonna anyway <sighs> I think that's a great so I think there's a lot of conscious and we have to bring consciousness back into this and I think there's an opportunity for the um, people who are coming up in the psych you know the psychiatrists like psychologists to start asking those questions I mean there you know it starts there too and I think we all have a part you know even as people in the culture we have to think differently so I think there's an opportunity but you're absolutely right like who who's deciding this why are we giving our power away yeah and just because so. you're a little different or eccentric or something right oh. right all right so I, we're totally off our questions that we yeah. had <laughs> So what? It's fine. I knew this was going to happen, but I want to read some comments from the audience and I'll just, some of them are just comments. Some of them are questions. So I'm just going to go ahead and read them. 
So one said, I didn't realize that it took activists to get the black box warning on these drugs. Thank you to everyone who worked on that. Another one is information allows for you to ask questions and watch your body more closely with people you trust. So in other words, like putting the black, like you said, information, it's just information. We're not telling you not to take them, but you need the information. All right, and somebody said, I'm sorry, but we do need to blame the doctors. If you can send a hot woman to flirt with a physician and that alone is enough to convince the physician to prescribe a higher quantity of suicide inducing drugs to children, then we do need to blame doctors. Point taken. All right, somebody asked, what is the solution? I think we kind of touched on it. You know, that ask questions. I don't know, what do you think? What's the solution to some of these problems? Well, first of all, to the person who said something about our doctors, uh, there is something to be said about, you know, back when Woody was, um, when Woody was alive, the doctors didn't know because they intentionally didn't, but there, you know, now there's information. And if our doctors aren't curious enough, uh, to go in and dig deeper, you know, there is something to be said about shame on you. Now there might be new drugs that, you know, we start learning, you know, I'll always give them a little bit of, you, I won't let them off totally scotch-free because I think they do need to know that they, these drugs are serious mind altering drugs that have a history behind them. And if they're really curious, they would go and learn about the 91 to 2004, 2006 to where we are today. And I sit um, so I know I'm going to go off another thing, but I sit on an FDA advisory committee and I see the new drugs that are coming to market and how they're coming under, under, um, to market that I think it's really important that we as consumers, uh, are educated and also feel empowered to push back and ask questions and not be told that they know best. And so I think that is a solution that we have to feel and have information and feel empowered. Yeah, and that's the last question I wanna to get to for sure, is can you tell me about this FDA psychopharmacologic, I can't even say it, I know, psychopharmacologic drug advisory committee. Like what is your role? What do you do? What do you see? Um, how, what do you think about when you vote on a new drug and how have you been received on these committees? Well, first of all, I feel like it's, I still can't believe I ever got on it because I have a different perspective than a lot of people. But, you know, when I look back at 1991, this committee that had the opportunity to have put a black box warning or put some kind of association and they didn't do their job and then to find out they all took monies from the industry, that then made it really clear to me that something had to be done. And then going to all of these committees, I saw the consumer person usually came from a, um, an industry kind of perspective. And so again, money. So I felt like it was important to have a safety perspective and also um, to be on that committee. Um, I look at my job as representing the public. I also come again, when I think of consumer, I have a perspective of not only, you know, I don't take my first, my personal experience, but I think about the whole experience of like the advocate, like how does Congress play into this? You know, I look at my advertising background, which is we, when we take on a new client, we have to look at everything from a 360 degrees, like what's the business problem? What's the, you know, so I love to hear what Wall Street has to say. And then I look at the data and the data that we have um, you know, like some of the drugs are coming to market with only like a small under a pathway, a fast tracking pathway called breakthrough therapy designation. And so when you hear the word breakthrough, a lot of uh, the public thinks, or even our doctors that breakthrough is like a new drug, like this will be great. It's a new Parkinson's drug for Parkinson's psychosis or a, a new um, nasal spray for depression. You know, they're looking mm -hmm. at it um, and they don't realize that breakthrough is really a regulatory pathway to get a drug on the market quicker. And it's only, you don't need the traditional like double two double blinded placebo controlled studies that we all believed as the gold standard. So, you know, you start looking at all of that and I really weigh the, is it clear, is it a, is it, 
just a little bit benefit in it or is and what's the potential adverse event or are there going to potentially be adverse events because in my mind by the time it gets to an advisory committee it's pretty much it going to probably be approved so then i think about what do you do when advertising when this small clinical trial and you can we you know every a lot of people on the committee are um fighting over the nuances of like was this the right tech technical clinical trial mechanism but I look at it and think, what is it going to be when millions of people start taking the drug, right? So that's kind of my perspective. Um, I love being on the committee. You know, I think I was really nervous at first because um, I don't have PhD. I don't have MD. I don't have all those letters behind my name. I'm just, I have just a BA. <laughs> uh, um, that at that point, I, I, realize that there has to be that perspective that says it if nothing else it's on the record and somebody years down the road can go and read the transcripts but i am often the only no vote or and because i'm looking at safety and then i always tell the media you know it'll get reported like 17 to 1 or 18 to 3 or whatever go ask the people who voted yeah. no yeah. ask them why because yeah. that's the curious part, not like, of course, you know, they all report on, um, cause almost immediately a press release comes out from the company. And so it's an interesting perspective. I encourage everybody to um, get involved, especially right now, everything's online. You can watch um, these new FDA hearings. Wow. And didn't, didn't I hear somewhere, even the yeses, some of them are like not a hard yes. Oh, yes. I was going to say that's a really good point. Um, so one of the things that we get the opportunity after they vote, and so it'll be like 18, you know, you get to say my name is and I voted yes or no, because and it's really important those reasons, because if you actually listen, there'll be people who will I voted yes, but yeah. um, I'm still concerned that we don't know the long term safety of what's going to happen right and then it'll come to me and i'll be like well that's interesting i voted no for the exact same reason you voted yes wow. so we actually both so you actually think about it we actually had the same reason why we voted the way we did amazing well so we are running out of time so fast and i wish we weren't because i could just talk about this uh especially advocacy i think we need to do a part two about advocacy just itself because I'm just so passionate about it too. And, you know, there's advocacy that can happen that people don't even know that they can get involved with. We just think, you know, I'm in my bed and I'm in withdrawal. And like, what am I supposed to do? There's nothing I can really do. So can you talk about what can people do right now if they've had an adverse experience or um, something happened to someone in their family? Like what can the average Joe on the street do as far as advocacy goes? Well, I always say this, be willing to share your story and tell your story because a lot, and first, because you realize you're not alone, but you also empower somebody else because you know, one of the reasons why these things happen, they're all isolated, right? And so when you start connecting these communities, I think that's really important. I also have started to realize what I do on the inside, that's not changing the world. It's gonna be, the, it's gonna be us, the people on the outside. And it could be that if you're a writer, start writing. Um, when I saw this yesterday, at the, they were doing these quilt squares. I'm like, how cool would it be if there was a quilt um, somebody took on because that's their art and, po you know, quilt, like every story had a quilt, like a quilt wow. square. And you did a big thing that went to traveled. I mean, we, I think there's things that we can think about that that then becomes until the power is never going to change top down, right? It's going to start here with us. And I really believe it is the people that can do it and it starts small right it, oh, and, God, think, I still agree with you. Yeah. and it and it's that we are powerful like you know i think about a quote and i think um and i i've always heard the margaret mead like you know it's who can change the world a small group of people who are committed and i think if it's in your heart whatever it is and it could be that you love dogs or you're gun violent like whatever like whatever it is i feel like you can do something something Yes. But I, tell your story. Yeah, I had a social work professor uh, while I was in school, and I wrote up this really long research paper about benzodiazepines and increasing suicide risk in veterans. And like it was really well, you know, in, there was not one piece of me in the paper. It was very matter of fact for a legis you know, legislative body. 
And she read it and she was like, Angie, why don't I know about this? And I was like, I don't know. And she's like, you guys have to, have to. like it is, we, the whole public needs to hear about this and it's happening to like everyone, you know, a lot of people. So anyway, yeah, that always, that just, yeah, you have to tell your story in whatever way you can. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you start, and then we can use those stories. And they also like, you know, somebody might want to do it. There might be activists and advocates that maybe don't have the personal thing, but they're in their psychiatrists or, and I think you're having a guy on in a couple of weeks. Um, I love reading some of his thoughts that he mm -hmm. keeps throwing out there in questions. Like yeah. there are advocates too inside the system in their field. So I feel like it can happen on many levels, but at the end of the day, I think it's about empowering, like giving us information or making us realize that we can question. And if you really, because if you start thinking like, this doesn't make sense, or you're in this system or people are telling you you're this, to step back and go, we are powerful individuals as people, like as, I mean, we have it in our spirits are powerful and we just have to, and we can't, we have to try to preserve our individual power and not be told that and trust and blindly trust totally oh my gosh well thank you kim that was a very yeah. powerful hour and i i feel like yeah we could talk for hours because there's just so much here um lessons learned ways of advocacy you know um just helping each other i mean oh i won't even say anymore i don't want to ruin it it was just great um so let's let i'll just read the the re do you have any closing thoughts yeah, let's, do you have any closing thoughts about what we talked about, anything we missed or anything? Well, I have to say um, a closing thought, and I probably have said a lot of them, but <laughs> I would say the people I have met along the way who like you and people I've connected on Facebook and people like, there's amazing people out there that have been harmed. And I feel like we have to do whatever we can do for other people, future people. And for those who don't have the, like I have, I have a voice that I, I lost somebody, but I have a voice to make sure that I don't, that somebody else's family has a chance that we didn't have. And so I think that would be um, realized that there are people that, I don't know, it's the people, the community that I've heard and harmed people. I get make, makes me so mad um, because, that's what it's all about, like life. So I know I have a lot of other thoughts, but I'll leave it at there because we have an hour. <laughs> oh, I know, Kim. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us for this live discussion. If you haven't seen Medicating Normal yet, please check our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch. You can see a list of upcoming community screenings, or you can check our events tab on our Facebook page. We add more screenings and update that very frequently. We currently release new videos on YouTube every Wednesday and Friday at noon central time. And we have more live interviews coming up. Uh, Kim mentioned Dr. Healy is coming. I just booked him today. I'm so excited. We're gonna be talking about groupthink in the medical system and sexual dysfunction. Also, we have Roger McFillin, a board certified psychologist and Bob Whitaker, everybody knows and loves him from Mad America. Those are just some of upcoming weeks. If you'd like to support our outreach efforts and bring the film and more conversations like this one, please consider a donation, big or small, at medicatingnormal.com slash donate. Thank you, Kim. Oh, thank you. I could keep going. So I know but we should just both shut up because we'll just go for hours. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say um they can follow me and oh, yes. how do we find you? How do we how do people want to get in touch with you? Uh connect, I mean they can connect with me on Facebook, um, as well as kimwitzak.com woody matters uh i would love to hear from people and and kind of figure out what we can do and if you've got questions or if i can be of help please perfect and nicole will put all of that in the uh chat box below and i'll make sure it's on our youtube channel of how people can get a hold of you well thank you kim you're the best thank you everybody for the good work thank you for all the work you do thank you for taking your tragedy and turning that into power and trying to help other people. And like you said, it will always be on the record, the way that you've voted, the way that you have advocated. So just thank you for being you, who you are. I just, I just give you a hug. All right. Virtual hug. One day in person, we will meet. We will, we will. Oh my goodness. Again. All right. Thanks everyone. All right. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye, -bye.